Welcome back to the Better Men, Better Ball Player Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Cobb. And I want to thank you for rejoining us here. We're back. We took a little vacation there, took a little break um, as life happened and uh, needed to take a pause. And we are back uh, based off of a lot of feedback and guys that were um, ready for more. I should say, and I really appreciate all the feedback that we got th- during the little dead period there, and um, excited to get back, and, and really excited to uh, welcome uh, another great guest, and you be a chance to talk some great baseball with head coach at University of Charleston, West Virginia, Coach Robbie Britt. Uh, you've probably seen Coach Britt. Uh, he's a barnstormer uh, clinician. Uh, he's been on multiple podcasts before. Extremely brilliant, uh, bright coach, and... Um, you know, a little bit about Coach Britt uh, from the University of Charleston. He just finished his third year there for the Golden Eagles. A couple of uh, program best. Uh, they've been 16-game winning streak, been the longest in program history. They've been as high as 11 in the country, which is program uh, landmark. And uh, this is the third straight season where they won the conference championship. They've hosted a regional, uh, which was also a first time in the program's history they've done. Fourth straight semester with a team GPA of 3.0 or better with serving over 1,000 community service hours. They've had five top 25 victories, uh, including their victory over the number six ranked Ashland, winner of 15th ranked Wingate. Again, these are firsts in program history. Uh, and he has uh, 40th, uh, his record of 40 and 18 this past year was the second most in program history when they won the conference championship. They were the finest in the regional and his overall record is 82 and 36 at the University of Charleston. Just a, a tremendous, tremendous coach um, who, again, taking over for Andrew Wright and still continue with their um, very innovative processes, uh, unique ways of developing a staff, empowering his leaders, which is his owner and CEO of the Culture House LLC is what it's called, Entire Empowering Leaders, Inspiring Excellence. So just a, a great guy to kick this back off, get this thing back rolling um, with Coach Britt, things that I just love talking to him, had a great conversation, and really looking forward to it, and hope you will too. Um, really got to thank our sponsors. They continue to sponsor us, take care of us. You guys have seen it. I know that guys are um, – Seeing good things come up as we've, you know, kind of getting back in the summer. Guys are ready for podcasts and things like that. But our sponsors at Netting Professionals are improving programs one facility at a time. Netting Professionals specialize in design, fabrication, installation of custom netting for backstops, batting cages, dugouts, scoreboards, BP screens, and ball carts. They also design and install digital graphic wall padding, windscreen turf, turf protectors, dugout benches, dugout cubbies, and more. Netting Professionals continue to provide quality products and services to many recreation, high school and college fields, facilities, and stadiums throughout the country. Contact them today at 844-620-2707 or info at nettingpros.com. Visit them online at nettingpros.com or check out Netting Pros on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn for all the latest products and projects. So again, big shout out to those guys being part of the Netting Pros family. And just looking forward to getting this thing rolling. Um, it, it, it helps me. And... Um, you know, based on the feedback, I'm hoping it continues to help you. I think there's definitely some nuggets here. Coach Britt is, I guess, a very creative, innovative coach. We get to talk about, we get to dive into, of course, the staffing stuff, what they do as a program. Uh, we talk about the transfer portal um, and just kind of what his process, the thoughts are there, as amongst any other things. Um, but just you, very unique ways of saying things, and I think that's what's always valuable for us as coaches. We're always looking for those things that, how can we reach each of these kids? And because we're, they're each a little different, but if I can say it a little differently, and I think that's what Coach Britt really does make some make some great insights. So again, thanks for so much. Uh, looking forward to it. Get this thing back rolling again. And what a great start with Coach Robbie Britt from the University of Charleston. What is something that you feel that that you guys uh, something's not talked about enough at Charleston? Oh wow! Um, well, that's a great great question to start off with. I mean, I, I think the staffing piece does get overlooked sometimes, you know, because there's a lot of focus on the player development, the um, 
you know, obviously the winning and success on the field, but, but really I'm probably most proud of the staffing and the creativity that it provides our student athletes. Like the, the experience is what we're all about. And so when I look at the, the group of 10 coaches that we've put together and the youthfulness of those coaches, I mean, we had, I was the oldest this year at 29 years old. So you're talking about a, a program that won 40 games, won a conference regular season and tournament title, played in a regional final, and didn't have anybody on their staff that was 30 years or older. I think it speaks to the fact that, you know, if you hire great people and you unlock them and empower them to do great work, that there's still th great things that can happen. And um, I think it, it provides a great experience for our kids. It helps us build a brand on social media. When you have people like – Bree, who is our director of creative content, who's putting out something every day. I know some people probably frown upon that, but for me, like, I think you're trying to promote your student athletes. You're trying to give them a Division One experience at the Division Two level. So, you know, I, I think it's an incredible piece of our program. It's something I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that seven coaches that have coached with me now have full time jobs at other schools in college baseball. Like I'm incredibly proud of that piece of our program. And I think they do a great job of adding to our student athlete experience while they're here. Can you get into like the, the how, like, uh, can we talk about like, it, it, and like you talk about unlocking, uh, and I, like, I love the word unlocking, unlocking them to do great work. And how do you, one, uh, like, do you have a specific thing that you're looking for, for a guy that you you have the trust to unlock them? Um, and then I guess the expectations of like, what do you expect when you plan on uh, giving them the keys? Yeah, that is, that is, uh, scary. Sometimes it's kind of like that, uh, Carrie Underwood song, you know, Jesus take the wheel. There's, there's <laughs> times where it's, you know, you just sort of cover up your eyes and hide in the corner. Um, but no, I think if you're trying to hire people that are self-starters, number one, so they've got to be internally motivated. Like, everybody's first semester at Charleston on our staff is always very challenging because they get in the door and I'm not going to sit there and tell you what you need to do every single day. So if you're not internally motivated, then you're really going to sort of struggle because you're going to be looking for uh, somebody to show you what to do. And that person's not going to be there. So, you know, my job is to hire people that are sort of self starters, internally motivated, uh, I would say growth minded, you know, you've got to be somebody that really wants to learn and wants to grow. Um, and then the final piece would be collaborative in spirit because you're going to be working with uh, between seven to 10 other young coaches, many of whom are in their first professional opportunity. And so, you know, mistakes are going to be made. There's going to be issues that arise. Um, but I really feel like that, that collaborative spirit, you know, working together to, do something that by yourself you wouldn't be able to accomplish. And that's really what I think our staff has tried to adapt is that, that model. And then we try to relay that and funnel that down to our student athletes as well. So, um, you know, I think the, the, the other piece and Trey, I don't know if this would be significant for you and working with your travel organization, but I think you can replicate that model. Like I've talked to a lot of high school coaches that are interested in, in doing that. And I think if you've got enough, um, intestinal fortitude to, to maybe get a high school student involved and give them the keys to your social media, which might be scary, but if you, if you create clearly defined expectations for them and you educate them on what exactly you want it to look like, and then you empower them to try and fail, you know, I think there's a lot of young people that are looking to break into our profession and just haven't had that opportunity yet. So that's what, you know, again, I take pride in, in being the program and my predecessor, Andrew, who I know you know really well, like he did the same thing. That was sort of a one thing that, that he trademarked at Charleston too. So, um, but I think you can replicate it. I think you can do it at different different places, and I'd love to see more programs try to implement it. Yeah, that's that's exactly where I was going because we have you know so many so many great high school coaches too, you know, and the, you know, and it's not just uh, in high school, but it's also in colleges. You know, we hear the college stories of guys being on their own, uh, being in their own show. Um, how how do you do that? Like, how wh where would you suggest them start? I know you said about like a high school student uh, getting involved. Um, would you say like, let's say I'm by myself, like, would that be like one of your first things that you would say, like, hey, let's just go ahead and get this person who's gonna kind of yeah. build our brand? 
I think you have to identify what what you want it to look like. I mean, ultimately, that's what the leader is responsible for is creating the vision. And so I always talk to our staff about vision having width and depth. So you want your vision to be wide, meaning you're going to include more people than just yourself. If it's just about you, then that vision is going to be very dim and you're probably not going to have a very good chance to reach it. So you want to have a wide ranging vision that incorporates a lot of people. And then that vision needs to have depth too. So depth is, you know, it can't just be about winning as cliche as that sounds. Of course, like I love to win, you know, that's obviously why you compete, but um, it has to be about something greater. So when we talk about creating a, we call it transcendent student athlete experience, a next level experience for our student athletes. Like to me, that means that we need to be trying to tell their story through social media. We need to be following name, image, and likeness really closely, even if we're a division two school. Like we need to be thinking creatively about what do we want this experience to look like for our kids? And, uh, you know, if you're going to sign up to come play at Charleston, like it's not the cheapest school in the country, um, you know, Charleston, West Virginia, even though there's a lot to do, it's not New York City. So you better provide an elite experience of some sort. And so as the leader, you know, my job is to create that vision. And what I think that allows you to then do is say, okay, what are the people who or who are the people or what are the things that I need in my organization to help fulfill that vision. So for me specifically at Charleston, like I am not good with social media. I am not good with like designing graphics and things of that nature. Um, like if it's up to me, I'm trying to make a PowerPoint slide and then turn it into a JPEG and then upload it to Twitter. Like it's a debacle. So I knew that I needed to hire somebody. Um, I hired Brianna Miller was her name from Eastern Mennonite University. And you know, Bree, her responsibility is to tell our program and our players stories in a 21st century capacity. Like that's the makeup of her job. Nice. TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, pictures, videos. Her job is to tell that story in a, in a media form that people our age understand. And so, um, you know, I think about Pablo, who's our offensive coordinator. Like he's not just a hitting coach. He coordinates the offense. He, He does everything from that capacity. So, you know, somebody that could step in and could run the base running and could run the hitting so that I can be more of a CEO and work with a number of different areas. And so just really, number one, having the vision, I think, is where I come in, where the head coach would come in, and then figuring out who and what. Who do I need and what do I need them to do? And then designing a clearly defined program for that individual. That's that's how you unlo- unlock them or empower them to do great work. When it comes down to like what you're saying about clearly defining programs for individuals, and it, it seems it always seems to me, you know, with, it, with from Coach Wright and then from where, where you're at and what you guys did, then it, it those clearly defined programs almost, I would say, almost lended itself to like you said the player development part, where you're developing programs for the player. I'd like to think so, and, and I know there's a lot of descendants of both Coach Wright and, and myself that uh, hopefully are, whether they're, I know some of them are working in facilities now, pro ball, other colleges, like, I think that uh, they learn some of those skills at Charleston, or at least that's my hope, but yeah, again, that's part of your vision, so for me, like, I want to have a program where players feel like they can come here and they have the resources, and they have the people around them, and they have the structures in place for them to develop as a person and as a player. So I need to make sure I have a director of player development, uh, Zach Casso, who, you know, Zach's job is, you know, it's, it's, it is about the player development. It's about tracking certain things for our guys, making sure that we are aware of certain metrics. There's a little bit of an analytics feel to it. And then there's also the personal development side where every Monday we call it cast clip quote. So on our communication platform, Zach is going to curate around a theme. It could be like toughness one week or gratitude or depending on where we're at in the year, what the holidays are. He's going to curate a podcast, a video clip, and a quote around a certain theme. He's going to spit that out to our players every week. So I think that when you have the vision of, hey, I want our guys to develop personally and as a player, then that is what influences the leader to say, all right, I need to have a director of player development. 
this is what the position would look like. And then it also then allows that person to go out and execute the position at a really high level. So, um, you know, again, the genesis of that predates me for sure. Um, I think what we've tried to do is we've tried to take the nuts and bolts that had ha that had been in place before. And we've tried to expand upon it. We've tried to elevate upon that uh, platform. And I like to think that we've done a pretty good job with it. I agree. And so let me just use your innovative creative mind and let's put yourself in the, and again, the other high school hat in a high school hat in the high school setting, the high school challenges. Um, and again, this could be even a smaller, you know, division three school too. Um, where, how do you do, how, how would you go about that, that kind of role? Well, I, so I, I played Division three. I coached at that level for a year, and then I also was a high school teacher for uh, a year at Rossview High School in Clarksville. So I've lived that life, and I think I'm still living that you know, now at Charleston uh, to some extent. But I, I think you have to look at your resources. So some people are worried about their resources, and other people are focused on their resourcefulness. So for us, you know, we're always looking at, okay, there's obstacles in place, but we're going to treat those as opportunities. We're going to say, all right, there's an obstacle, but how can we circumvent that and create something beautiful despite that obstacle? So I think that's the starting point for a high school coach. I've, I've heard so many times um, the high school coach that says, oh, well, we just don't have the resources to get that done. And there's definitely some truth to that. It might be that there's no money, the booster club's not as involved, the administration's not supportive. You know, those are definitely real obstacles that need to be focused on. But I also think if you really are creative and you look at, all right, what about students uh, that, that might be interested, not in baseball, but in media graphic design? You know, that's what we did at Rossview. Um, we had an arts and media design academy at our school. And so mm. my first thought is like, okay, well, these are incredibly creative kids. They don't care a thing about baseball, but can I get them to use Photoshop to create a graphic for our game schedule? And we pumped that out on social media. You know, I had so many kids in my classes, 156 students, and we would have so many of them that were very, um, very good at using Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat. And so my thought is like, let's leverage that skill set. Let's utilize that skill set. Um, same thing with, you know, even on the academic front, like, are there people on campus that want to help tutor, want to help mentor? your baseball players and so just finding ways to like could you even could you bring another teacher I'm just thinking of this on the spot I'm spitballing but let's say could you bring a math teacher into your program and just say here are some of the things that we're interested in studying could you help us break down these metrics we'll give you a baseball hat we'll put you on our website we'll call you the you know special assistant to the head coach for analytics you know create some kind of title that is meaningful um, you know, treat them like a coach, maybe try to get them a stipend if your county school system will allow you to do that. And now all of a sudden you have a director of baseball analytics at the high school level. And so you don't want to do it just for the sake of doing it. But if there's value that can be added to your program, I think it just takes somebody with a creative mind and uh, the willingness to be told no. You know, I, I've been told many times no by people that are saying, hey, you know, you can't do this or you can't do that. And to me, that's just saying, we're not going to do it this way. So I'm going to go look at another direction that maybe we could attack in order to accomplish the same goals. So I think it's one of the most underutilized tools at the high school level, but it's also one of the most necessary tools at the high school level. Like there's so many coaches that I've talked to that are starting to do that little by little. And a lot of times it's, it's they're coming back to me and saying, you know, hey, this is this was awesome. You know, thanks for the the counsel. Thanks for the insight, um, and it helps us too. So uh, the last piece I'll share is Olentangy Orange High School, where my buddy Tom Marker is the head coach at. I know you have a relationship with him as well. We have our, our director of baseball analytics is a sophomore in college. Her name is Abby, and we recruited Abby from Olentangy Orange just like a student athlete. She came on a visit. We recruited her texted and called and said, hey, we want you to come to Charleston. She's on scholarship. She's a sports analytics major on campus, and she is our director of analytics at age 19, 20 years old. And so she got her foundation. We found her because she was doing the same thing for Tom Marker at Olentangy. So, you know, I just think that there's 
great opportunity for young men and women that want to get into our game. Um, they just need the opportunity. We call it the front door opportunity. Like if somebody will let them in the house, then they're going to have a shot to be really special. Wow, that was super cool, man. Uh, recruited your director of analytics just like a student athlete. That was – yeah, that's great. I think that's going to open some eyes for sure, man. That's gold. That is freaking awesome. And of course, put it past Tom, put it past Tom. The, you know, here's an elementary school teacher too. I don't people realize about Tom, you know, like, but I was a much school teacher for 11 years, man. That's, that's where you learn your pedagogy, man. You learn how to manage different groups, pockets. You know, you've got this kid reading at seventh grade level. You got this kid just learning his, his alphabet, you know, and they're in the same room. Teach them. That's one of my favorite things about Tom specifically. And, and, you know, I have so much respect and admiration for him is, is he's an incredible teacher. Yep. So, you know, if you're a, like to me, I, I, I think of myself as a teacher, my content area is just baseball, but I was going to crush it no matter what I was teaching in the classroom. So when I was teaching 11th grade U S history, like we were really freaking good in that classroom. And it was because it wasn't about the content. It's about, you know, I know it's cliche, but the life skills and character traits that you're teaching through the platform of history. And so Tom and I talk about that all the time. Um, but again, like I think I'm very passionate about that message to coaches is like if you're just if you're coach, if you're teaching so you can coach, then you've got the whole thing out of whack. Like you are a teacher that may teach math for six period and then you teach baseball for two hours in the evening. But you know, you should be teaching everybody, you know, at, at, at your maximum level, at the, at the best that you possibly can. And so um, I've always respected that, that about Coach Marker and really about high school teachers in general. I mean, I think, you know, high school coaches uh, and, and, and travel coaches, summer coaches that have other jobs, like it is very, that's a very tall task. That's very challenging, especially if you're doing it right and you're doing it well. Um, and so I have so much admiration for people that do amateur baseball because usually you're working another job and then you're, you know, podcasting on the side to try to help coaches. You're, you know, teaching lessons from three to 10 PM as a side hustle so you can take care of your family. Like it's, uh, it's pretty incredible what, what people do to, to stay in this sport. Yep. Good people, man. That's why it's good to know good people and, um, and have those kind of guys like Tom, you know, that you're working toward to keep you moving you know the guys who have texted me and said hey man with the podcast you know like it just keeps you going i think those are when you have a really good circle um and that's another valuable lesson that taken away from all these guys that just fortunate to talk about man like they're all like you said they're they gotta you said one of your first ones you got to be a learner you got a growth mindset you know when you surround yourself with those people too it, it, it makes it pretty easy to continue that you know because it's very easy for all of us just to peck our feet up and it's what we want to do but you know you get around good guys man it just keeps you moving yeah no doubt from, from your perspective having worked at you know the high school level you know travel ball as well as junior college baseball too you know what are some of what are some of the experiences you've had with that or, or some of the uh things that your big takeaways in terms of working at some of those different levels um it's 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 uh at all the different levels, I mean, the level of care, I think. I think you said, like you said, when you're doing it right, people people know. Um, when I came into travel ball, um, and the level of care and the, what I was doing was, was people weren't used to it, I think, just from other travel balls, maybe teams that they were on. Um, I'm certainly not a seasoned coach. Like, even in high school, you know, you got your guys that show up in March and they're done in May. and uh, just wasn't me. Um, so I think just through my experiences is just like that, you know, and coming back, I went, I came back to a, a program with, with Hagerstown and, and after I've been away since oh, for a while and, and just, just my style of, of caring and, and, and being relationship driven is, is what kids really, um, they're all, they all still hunger it, you know, and, and they all like a, like what you're like, what you're creating across as a brand, it's an identity, you know, and kids crave that. Um, people do. And, uh, and those are kind of the commonalities um, that I see it within them all. It's just a matter of like different levels. You just get to work with maybe like uh, 
Cause like for me as a teacher, like, <clears throat> you know, you get in high school, you'll get your two or three, depending on your program, you know, quality kids travel ball. You get to spend with a little bit more, um, different Juco levels. And, you know, they're all different Juco levels. Um, you get to be with a little bit more and the, and the commitment levels are there. So like, that's the differences too. Like, uh, and then how to balance that within you goes, that's where like your depth, I love the word depth where you came in with your vision is I think as a high school coach, it really, it made me create depth. And I don't think travel, you don't need to be as depth, but even though that's just who I am, like, that's how I coach. That's what I do. Um, but I think it's very easy not to be have depth because I found out real quick at a small one, a school in Maryland, it ain't all about the wins. <laughs> um, cause we're going to play up all the time. <clears throat> you know, we're going to play up all the time. And, uh, and in Maryland, you have severe restrictions on what you can do outside of, outside of your, of your spring, um, severe. And so, um, you know, uh, you just learn really quick to have that depth. Um, so I, that was a big thing that stuck out with high school. Um, but again, everybody loves a good identity. Everybody wants to be cared for, uh, and shown value. And, um, but, uh, all of them, um, have been, have been good for me and, uh, appreciate you asking that, you know, just that I don't get the chance to reflect on it too much. And I, I'm still relatively new to travel. Honestly. Uh, I just, I had a team in the fall. Well, I've been recruiting for every year, but last summer I, I was helping a team this, this fall. I had a team that I was recruiting. We keep recruiting. Um, and of course we're playing now, but, um, but yeah, man. Such a unique experience, like to have worked at a number of different levels like that. You know, and I mentioned earlier, like being a D3 player, having taught at the high school level, having been at the Division One level for a couple of years as an assistant, and then now at Division Two, like you just there, there's definitely a sense of awareness that is built from having the opportunity to work at those different levels, and you, you realize that there's not that big of a difference. You know, whether that's like us this year going up and playing WVU and and on a midweek and, you know, having a lead going into the ninth inning, like, you know, that's a, that's a team that probably should have been in the NCAA tournament and, uh, you know, to take them right up to the wire. I just think there's a lot of really good baseball out there. And um, even at the high school level, you know, there's just so many different pieces to that puzzle. And so the more levels that you can work with, I think the experience piece is, is crucial to developing that awareness and developing that care level that you mentioned. So, uh, pretty neat that you've had a chance to work, you know, in those different capacities. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think too, um when you said when when you want to learn too, that's when you'll take away those things. I think when you said like you have a growth mindset, you know, like what can I get a what can I take away here? How can I learn um from this experience um to get better as a coach. Um but like I said I am at the heart of myself I've realized like I'm a teacher. Like I like to teach, I like to coach. And if you don't like being coached up, then you're not really going to enjoy uh, being, being around me. <laughs> um, that's just, that's just, I do. I love, and I'm not trying to, and, I, and I'm very aware of overcoaching um, cause that I've made those mistakes in the past, you know? And, uh, but you know, just like any good teacher, I'm going to be overplanned and overprepared and we'll get to what we get to from there. But uh but yeah, man, like it's, it's, it's been good. And then this is a unique travel experience because like, I'm not just sticking with an age level. Like I'm going to quote unquote loop loop is a teaching term. Like you just travel with your eight with, I teach second grade. Then I teach them in third then I teach them fourth. I did that one year. I went to them when I went from fifth grade, it was funny. I went from fifth grade. Then I took a job at the middle school and taught sixth grade. So those fifth graders were now my sixth graders. And then the next year, my principal wanted me to teach seventh grade. So I actually looped with them for three years. So that was pretty wild. There was a couple of kids who were like, all right, I think you need somebody else. <laughs> and, um, but I'm like, that's how like this travel experience will be. Like, I'm going to have them there as freshmen. They just finished up the freshman year. We're going to have them as sophomores and then juniors. And then basically that, that fall going in their senior year, like that's really it. Um, so that'll be a unique experience, you know, and that's, that's the plan right now. Um, so that'll be unique. Uh, but again, just handling all those things where Kaiser, we have guys committed right now, guys that aren't really close to getting committed, but like they could be, you know, like you just never know where they're going to fall along. And, and me just trying to keep a level head of everybody about all that. Like that's very real. 
um, how things are right now, man. Like, um, just speaking of that, like, because uh, I got to talk to them about the transfer portal. Like you, like you, I mean, I was thinking about like when you, when you talk about the WVU game and things like that and um, just how close things are, like, like it has the tran is, do, would you feel like the transfer portal has really helped or, or, or impacted you in that way? Um, I think it's, I definitely think it's impacted, you know, college baseball. I, I think that's a no doubter. Um, you know, I think it's, it's kind of been a mute point for us up to this point. We've gotten some really good players out of the portal, but I think the, yeah, I definitely think that it's impacted college baseball as a whole. Uh, that's a, that's a non-negotiable that it's definitely done that. Um, and I think we try to find ways to use it to our benefit. Uh, at the same time, I think it's created a great opportunity at the division two level because just the, the, the overwhelming numbers of kids that are playing division one baseball and are going through that cycle, whether it's uh, transferring from a power five to a group of five school or a group of five to another group of five school. Um, uh, high school guys are, are kind of the ones that are still feeling the impact of, you know, COVID that we thought was going to, we, we thought it was going to impact the 2020 class. Then we thought it was going to impact 21s. Then we thought it was going to impact 22s. And now everybody's saying the same thing about 23s that, oh, nobody's out recruiting them. Um, you know, there's there's no college programs that are really honed in on high school kids right now. And I think for Division Two, it's created a great opportunity. And you saw it a little bit this past year where just the overall talent density of our level, I think, improved. Um, and uh, and you see that when Division Two and some Division Three schools level up and go play Division Ones and win or play them really closely like that's because the talent density at our level has definitely improved. And so um, I think for us, if anything, it said, hey, there's some 23s that typically would be going to a school in the MAC or going to a school in the Horizon League. And now it's like those schools just don't have room on their rosters right now. So it's an opportunity for us to, you know, again, showcase what we have to offer, which is a Division One experience at the Division Two level. And so, um, you know, I think it's a – it's a great opportunity for us. And, you know, I think very transparently, we've made it too easy for kids to enter the portal without consequence. And that's my personal opinion. I don't, I know there'll be, there'll be people that probably will disagree. Um, and if you look at our track record, if you graduate from Charleston, this is my policy. If you graduate from Charleston, you have honored your commitment and I will help you go wherever you want to go. We have a grad transfer that literally transferred to another school in our conference. And I helped him go there because he had honored his commitment to us. Our shortstop is going to grad transfer to USC upstate next year. And as much as I hate to lose Braxton, you know, I wrote him a letter of recommendation. I talked to their coaching staff on his behalf. Like, I think if you have that extra year of eligibility, Hey, that's, that's great. That's fantastic. I think the part that's definitely going to be an issue for college athletics in the next three to five to seven years are the freshmen that they don't get their way or it's not what they thought it was going to be. And instead of having the self-awareness and the self-discipline to actually fight through the challenge, they immediately jump in the portal and they use their one-time transfer like that. Well, what happens when they get to the next school and then the same thing happens? Then they've already used their one-time transfer. So there's a number of, I think, unintentional consequences that are going to come up here in the next three to five to seven years that are really going to test kind of the, uh, the, the transfer portal's validity and, and what it was really designed to do. I mean, you know, there are a number of situations where kids should be able to transfer freely. You know, if a family member gets sick, if a coach leaves, whatever the case might be, but to just say, hey, I'm going in the portal because you know, things didn't go my way I, I just think that's sending a bad message. And, you know, I guess my final thing on it would be they say they say that coaches can leave without consequence, but really that's not true either. Like coaches leave for a myriad of reasons. They might leave because of a bad contract situation or because of a family situation. and uh, They might get fired. So, you know, there's a lot of consequences that go in on the coaching side as well. And so I think to just open the floodgates and say guys can do whatever, it's, 
it's I think it's sad because it's really it's really putting a strain on the team sport mentality that we have in baseball and making it really difficult to create consistency and um, you know for us what it has done is it's it's made us be really focused on the type of people that we recruit. Number one, you got to be able to help us win on the field. But we've really started to identify what is a good fit at Charleston for us, like who are the players that we work really well with, and then we have to find those guys. We have to find those individuals in the recruiting process, which means turning down some really good players sometimes that we may not have turned down in years past. So that may be a, a positive or a silver lining from it. But you got me on my soapbox, so I apologize, but – being on the other side of it, I mean, I would counter back with just asking, you know, how, you said you were walking that line with some of your high school guys and some of your travel kids that you're coaching. You know, what's the feel on their end or from the parents' standpoint? Uh, in terms of the transfer portal? Yeah, in terms of the portal. <clears throat> right now, it's honestly because they're young. Like I said, they're just finished the freshman year. And it's just the education of it, you know. And, again, it's the patience. And you hear a lot of coaches say about patience and recruiting. And things like that. What will happen to happen? And it should. It's not, it's not our plan. Um, you know, things happen. And so um, it's, it's just a matter of the education right now. Like I, I sent out tweets and my messages to them, especially recruiting wise, is just the education is like, here's what you're also up against. You're also up against the transfer portal. It's not that you're up against another freshman. You're up against also like help. Well, the, the number one thing is they're going to go into the fishbowl and see what, what, because they, because like you said, you have guys that you know fit your mold. And here's a Charleston kid. This could be a Charleston kid. Well, they can go look at that Charleston kid and look for that kid in the transfer portal now. Number one, you know that guy's already been tested. He might he's a little stronger. Like you kind of, it's it's kind of an easier bet before you even go on JUCO. And then you got the JUCO kids. And then you know, so it's just depend on and everything's different. Um, but there was there's certain people that don't like JUCO kids, and there's certain people you know, like it just it's all depending on on the coaches. So. As of right now, well, where we're at and what I'm doing, it's just a matter of educating that. And just like that's also something that, one, I'm trying to learn more about um, just so that I can be more educated and help people through this process, you know, as, they're, as they are, you know, trying to get recruited. Uh, but it's just, it's just something else out there that you just got to, like you said, you're almost pushing through that, through that adversity of like it is. It is kind of a little what you would – some of it, I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I think it's slower for some kids who just maybe just – they just might not be really there. They might not be an absolute dude, though, you know, because we have some dudes that get – they get attention um, and have gotten attention. Um, so it just depends. Uh, but, it, like, right now we're still young. I think the education – because it is. I mean, how how long has the transfer portal been like this? It hasn't been too long. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the – you. you I, I would call it the evolution. You're seeing an evolution in terms of – you know, I think there's close to 4,000 names in the portal. And and the education piece, like, that's such a great point. And uh, this might be the dumbest idea that I've ever had, but ask my assistant coaches. I'm sure I've had some dumb ones uh, from time to time. But, you know, I've thought about doing a, a classroom session in our program about that just so guys could see what the portal actually looks like because it's almost this, like, imaginary place unless you have access to the actual portal. But the, the pieces to that puzzle, you know, when you go in and, and, you know, there's a section where you can make notes of, of things that you want to, you want other coaches to see. So, like, uh, if you're wanting to grad transfer, well, there's a time and place to probably do that. But if you do it right now, you're probably going to get a lot of unintended calls and you're going to waste your time. You're going to waste other coaches' time. You're also going to get lost in the shuffle of about 35 to 55, 60 new names going in every day. So now, you know, day one, you're on page one. Well, by day four, you're probably going to be on page four or page five of, of that portal. Well, how far back are those guys going to really scroll, you know, to find you? And, of course, they can always plug in your last name, but they would have to know about you in order for that to be the case. So, you know, I think there's a lot of educational points to that that could help somebody, even if Charleston's not the right fit, which – we're not the right fit for everybody. And just like anybody else, we make mistakes in recruiting as far as, you know, we may think that somebody's going to be a great fit and they get here and they don't like the experience. And, you know, so I think if we educate them on the front end, then maybe that helps them to find the right fit the second go around, which I think has just become a part of our game. So 
you know, I know I, I'm definitely – I have strong opinions on it, I think, as a lot of coaches do. Um, but I do think there's, there's, there is benefit to it, and there are times where it's definitely a great piece of the puzzle. And so I think it's educating your players on how to use it appropriately is maybe the next step for us as we evolve as a program. Maybe that's the area that I need to look at is, you know, how do we educate them on the front end to try to help them on the back end. Yes, but and that's where I kind of started thinking about like your staffing and like your your vision of it because it seems like this has to be part of a program now, like just like anything, where you almost need is this another person's job? Like, do you give do you create another position for a person that you know, or is this just part of the hat that everybody wears as recruiters? Yeah, I, I think we, you know, I'm sure a lot of programs have established like one person that's responsible for scanning the portal, you know, looking through that, Um, you know, we task our recruiting coordinator with doing that um, because we have a recruiting coordinator who he helps on the field, but his primary responsibility is, is recruiting. So that's, uh, that's maybe a little bit different than your typical assistant coach and recruiting coordinator. So we've kind of rolled it into that recruiting position, but you've given, you've given me an idea as far as the curriculum in our baseball classroom next year. And, you know, I'd probably have Grant, who's our recruiting coordinator, put that presentation together and probably run that classroom session with our team because I think he would be the probably the guy that would be best equipped to speak on that. For sure. And and I coming back to your staffing stuff is like, do you make it a point then to maybe have a weekly meeting with all your coaches as like let's just say for lack of better terms, like a checkup, but basically what you're doing is you're just holding them accountable to like, to the vision that you have, or like the expectation that you have clearly defined, then is it, you know, part of that growth plan is the accountability of it, right? Like, let's, all right, let's see where we're at. Do, is that something that you, you put in like weekly or is it like part of your staff meetings that everybody's kind of has this, like, you know, a check-in to kind of see where everybody's at? Yeah, we meet every day as a staff. So uh, that is, you know, again, like, I think that's where uh, we really try to run it like an organization or like a, like a small business. And yeah, like a board meeting. Like, here's your minutes. We're, we're, meeting, we're meeting every day as a staff. And so, um, you know, inside of that, there's, there's times where we'll, do in, we'll intentionally embed some professional development. We'll have staff presentations where assistant coaches will present for 12 to 15 minutes on a topic. And it, usually in the fall, it's like an update on their position group, like what's going on in their position group. And then I have individual meetings with coaches pretty much uh, definitely once a week with everybody on our staff, but sometimes a multitude of, of times throughout the week that we'll meet one-on-one or we'll meet in small groups. Um, we work in this conference room sometimes. And so our staff meeting will end, let's say at 945 and I'll walk in at 11 and there'll be three coaches that are sitting there planning out what they're going to do, or it'll be uh, our pitching coach, our recruiting coordinator, and Abby, and they'll be going over a recruit's profile, and they'll be talking about some of the metrics that they have and how that relates to um, the video that they're watching and what you know, Coach Zona, who's been my pitching coach for the last three years, what he thinks about the, the young man. And so it's, it's a, again, a very collaborative effort, I think, from that standpoint. But, yeah, it, it is – the unique part is not just the amount of people, but it's the expectation that we hold them to. Like if you're a GA and you're the offensive coordinator, to me, you're a full-time assistant. So you're in the office, you know, you are recruiting, you're working with that position group autonomously by yourself or with other position coaches. Um, But you're also held accountable for the results that go out on the field. So it's not just, oh, this is my GA. Like, they're not a GA. Like, that guy's working just as hard as my full-time assistant, my one full-time assistant. I have a part-time stipend position that's, you know, very small stipend, but he's a full-time guy. So we have to piece it together. we got to help him figure out camps. We've got to help him teach lessons and grow his lesson clientele in the community. So, But that guy's in the office. So that's the unique part is – you know, not just the number of people, but really the the standard that I think we try to hold them to. And um, that's not really a pat on my back, or I hope it doesn't come across that way. It's more about, like, to me, I'm always amazed with the 
the, the coaches that we have on staff, their commitment, their willingness to be a part of it, their desire to make a career out of this profession. And so that's the, that's the part that I'm in awe of all the time because everybody wants to coach college baseball, but I think it's really hard to do it when you're getting a $3,000 stipend for the year and you're having to figure out life and how you're going to survive on top of that. And you're recruiting and you're going to these games and you're at practice every day and you're in the office. Like that, we call them the unseen hours. I'm stealing that from um, Drew Hanlon, who's an NBA skills coach. He talks about the unseen hours. Like that is where I really just fall in love with our staff. Like they, you know, they earn so much of my respect is, not what they do from two to five in the afternoon, but really what they're doing from, you know, 7 a.m. or 9 a.m. till one o'clock when they go out on the field. Oh, yeah. Life is, uh, yeah, just trying to figure out life is important. Um, it's not easy either. No, no, it's not easy. And that's one thing, cause like, for me, like, in my, my story is just, you know, my wife's a partner at a CPA firm, you know, so she's crazy during the spring. And um, would love to, you know, coach in the spring. And, and I just made, had made a tough decision. Like, it was just that life. I wasn't the best dad. I wasn't the best the best person, best husband, you know, being that awake when she has to really be away uh, during that time for our twins, you know, too. So, um, and that's where just right now in our life, it's just what it works. And that's, so those unforeseen hours, yeah, man, I, I get you there. I, I hear what you're saying. And like I said, it's a big reason that I went to, to travel baseball myself um so but yeah for sure that's what it is this that's what makes it makes the people pretty special though when they're trying to figure all that out for you like you said the commitment level of trying to figure out all those pieces so they can make this make it work oh man that's really good really good um going to just a little bit of development like i was just going to pick your brain about this because everybody has like different things and I think we're getting better at metrics. I think we're getting better at like, like for me, it's always a matter of like the most bang for our buck, right? Is in, in terms of like your player development and the metrics that you may be following, what do you feel are like the, the core, most correlative metrics that is what's going to stand out for you for a Charleston baseball player? Yeah, so I'm actually going to take the cop out on this. Um, and I'm going to take the, the easy road. But we – this goes back to your vision. So um, as the leader, like I, I had to figure out, all right, what do I want our program to look like on the field as well? And so from the pitching standpoint, what are going to be the metrics that I think lead to winning? And I think I actually asked that question to our staff one day, and we had a really good staff discussion about what do we think leads to winning. And the whole goal with that was to clarify the, what you just asked, the metrics that are important. So, like, for us on the pitching side, um, we have what we call our core principles, then we have our primary strategies, and then we have our performance indicators. So the performance indicators are the metrics that we believe that are going to help us achieve success on the field and also help us achieve our core principles. Can you say those three things again? You said start, start with your core principles. Yep. So for every – piece of our program, pitching philosophy, recruiting philosophy, hitting philosophy, or offensive philosophy, we're going to have core principles, primary strategies, and performance indicators. So the core principles are what we believe at our core when it comes to that piece of the puzzle. So offensively, um, you know, our, I'm trying to think of what our core principles are offensively. We want to um, play as an offense, not just as a hitter. And so the primary strategies for us to do that would be for us to um, hit extra base hits, steal bases. We, we talk about playing on the front side of the field, which means finding ways to get to third and second. We don't want to be on the back side of the field first and home. So in order for us to do that, our performance indicators, we want to lead our conference in extra base hits. We want to lead our conference in on-base percentage, and we want to lead our conference in stolen bases. So those are the three things that we are looking at. Like at both years that I've been at Charleston, we have led the conference in doubles and triples, but we've been third in home runs. If I was just looking at the home run category, I'd be disappointed. But when you add all those up, 
to extra base hits than we've led the league every year that I've been at UC. And so to me, you look at us scoring 7.5, 7.7 runs per game in both of those years, that's a direct reflection of us getting to the front side of the field, doubles and triples as well as some home runs. Same thing with stolen bases. If we're leading an on-base percentage, walks, hit-by-pitches, infield singles, then we have to find a way, again, to get to second, get to third, get to the front side of the field. Well, then we better lead an on-base percentage, and we better steal a lot of bases. And so you know, this year I think we were 140 for 162 in stolen bases. Mm. Um, and so for us, what it, what it does is it directs you in terms of the type of players that you want to recruit, and it also directs you in how you want to allocate time during your training, or what we call it training, but practice. Like, when you go out there, if you've got two and a half hours, like, what do you want to devote your time on? And I think sometimes as coaches, we get lost in, like, oh, I want to, I want to train against Velo, or I want to train against the machine, or I want to put Rap Soto out there. And we do all of that, but we're not going to do it unless it's something that we feel is necessary to help us achieve one of our primary strategies or our, our primary core pillars, as we would call it, our core values. And so those are the pieces to the puzzle that I think we really spend a lot of time on. Um, and we do that for every area of the program. So I know that's kind of the cop out to the metrics question, but um, of course there's pieces like extra base hits, your exit velocity and your launch angle on balls batted in play. Like those are going to be telling signs potentially of your bat speed through the zone your ability to hit the ball in the gap or over the fence, which then would obviously lead to extra base hits. And so we just try to start kind of with the end in mind and then work back to the process and figure out what we need to, where we need to start from and what we need to really analyze. Yeah. I like that. Cause everything you start with the why, right? It's kind of starts with your principles and then you're kind of working out from the how and the what. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and so are you, when you go to recruit a kid, Right, because I always say this because you because typically you just get a snapshot. So, will you try and g gather so much of that with your homework of a kid? Yeah, depending on what's available, you know, I think that's always the challenging part. I'm sure you're, you know, going through this as well, both on the the travel ball side as as well as even probably on the junior college side too. Like the the amount of metrics, there's such a variability between what schools have, you know, there's some, yeah, there's some travel organizations that have hit tracks and have track man. And, you know, I, I went to the top prospect games in Ohio a couple of weeks ago. Well, they have track man for everything. So yeah, if that, if that data is available, I think that's only going to help you if you know what you're looking at. Um, at the same time, that's where I think the system that we've used has really been effective is I know that I, I need long, lanky athletes that can run pretty well. And I sort of know what I'm looking for in a swing that would translate to the things that we value at Charleston. Then it allows me to kind of take a little bit more of a, a qualitative approach rather than just being reliant on the analytics. It allows me to, to look at it a little bit more with my eyes or what I'm seeing. We call it the eye test. Um, literally, it's I'm, I'm 6'1". I'm about as average of an American as they get. <laughs> like, I probably could lose a little bit of weight, but you know, I'm six one. So if I walk up to the fence and the kid is as tall as me or taller, and I'm looking him in the eyes, like those are t the type of guys that we typically like at Charleston. Doesn't mean we won't take an undersized kid. We we definitely have done that in the past, but the eye test is a good starting point. Physicality wins, I think, um, in the long run. You got to have physical guys, and so that would be one element that fits us as a program. Other programs may not like that. You know, they may, they may not care about uh, that piece of the puzzle. So it really just comes back to understanding who you are as a program, what you think leads to winning, and then creating a clear picture so that, you know, when you're recruiting guys are out on the road, they know what they're looking for as well. Yeah, I just always uh, – for me, it's always the clarity part, you know. And how, 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 how long do you spend – like – what is like your personal, I would say like almost like personal process to gain the clarity? Like, cause I know for me, like it, it's, it's always, I always aspire to people like when, when, to, to their, to their clarity, you know, I think as the older you get, you know, I've been doing it for like 20 years. You're just trying to get simple and trying to get very clear. Um, 
what has your process been in terms of trying to get to that specific clarity? Like I remember your your one your one beautiful uh uh clear expectation of your girl about doing the creative content where her job is to make it in, in um oh how did you say it into our 21st century right into like what it looks like nowadays like whatever it was like what what is your process been to get like do you go through each st- each phase and and continue to uh, i'm just and how do you get cl- your clarity yeah i, I think the I don't know that we have that or that we ever will have that, if I'm being quite honest. Yeah. It's probably not the, the right answer, but um, I know Andrew, my predecessor, you know, Andrew always liked to use the word iterate. He would always iterate on the next thing, and I call it, you know, I use iterate from time to time, but uh, to avoid plagiarism, you know, I, I prefer like evolve or evolution, like to look at our program, you know, what it looked like when I first got to Charleston three years ago. And the way I communicated and the clarity that I provided for our staff and the way that I hired people, yeah, that has changed completely. And, and I, I almost <laughs> – I apologize sometimes to my previous assistant coaches because I'm like, you know, I, I apologize to those guys because I think, my goodness, you know, I failed you. And you know, they're always like, oh, no, you know, you were, you were doing what you thought you could do in that time and what you thought was best. But I look at it and I say, man, if you could only see – where the program's at now, you know, and um, it's definitely on the backs of those people. So when I think of an Andrew Wright, when I think of Ryan Hunt, who's with the Yankees, Dylan Mazzo, I mean, the list goes on and on. I'm going to, I'm going to definitely not name people, but even Ian McDonald, Anthony Zona and Michael Blashford and Trevor Bierman, like the guys that have been with me, like we're able to evolve because of the time that they spent and the struggle that they went through sometimes or the lack of clarity that they had um so i i would say it's, it's ever evolving you know and and the whole thing with like Bree's position and how we came up with that idea like that was at first it was just we just want to create a brand and then it became all right well how do we go about doing that and why do we want to create a brand well we want to tell our program story but it's not just good enough anymore to write uh, a story and put it on the website you know nobody's reading that story, you know, and, and the newspapers aren't going to print that. Like, we got to find a way to reach recruits and parents and other coaches in today's generation, which is through Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. And that's kind of how we came to that. So same thing in recruiting. Like, I didn't really know what I wanted the program to look like at the beginning when I first got here. And now we've kind of evolved to this point where it's like, all right, we know we, we need athletic guys that maybe have a little bit of diversity in the positions that they can play. And then we know that they need to probably run pretty well because that's a big piece of who we are. And, um, you know, they better be able to hit the ball in the gap, you know, not necessarily over the fence consistently, but they need to be able to drive the gaps because that's an important piece too. So I think clarity is always the goal, but evolution towards that clarity is I think the realistic method to get there. Oh, that's good. Clarity is always the goal. But I don't know that you're ever going to attain it. (laughs) But evolution, so what you said, you said, but evolving. But I think evolution towards clarity, you know, that's, that's what you're really trying to do. You're always evolving towards, you know, clarity. That's, that's kind of what you're, we, we call it excellence in our program. Excellence is your best on a daily basis. And so, We tell our guys to strive for excellence. And if your best is getting better and better, then you're going to hopefully be closer to the best version of yourself over a long period of time, you know. And um, so I think that's the the piece that we're we're always working towards, both as coaches and as players, is you know how do we how do we be our best and then show up the next day and change our best and try to make Mm. it a little bit better. Absolutely. Change your best. That's good. <clears throat> um, wow. I just, I just love, I mean, I just, these are the just, it's good things for me to know. Um, just different processes, you know, and I think talking to real smart guys like yourself and, and Andrew, you know, like just, it's, it's just really great to, because then you just know, um, 
I got I, I can't I keep using the word clarity. Like I said, it's just it's something I just love to admire. Like I love to get to because I think it because clarity gets done too. Like the simple gets done. And I think because you try maybe you have gone and been successful in recruiting is because you boiled it down to where, like you said, you you're looking for this certain guy and those certain guys they work for you. And and I will say this, like um well if if you're looking for the smartest guy in the room, then I just need to end the call and I can get to somebody. I can connect you with somebody else. But I think sometimes that that is the evolution. The evolution is not always doing more, but sometimes it's doing less. Like that was, uh, I ought to write a book on it. Honestly, that's maybe that's what I need to do. But call it the the uh, the simplification project because that's literally what we tried to do from 21 to this year in 22. So you know, 2021 had a great year, hosted a regional. You know, obviously COVID shortened uh, season, a lot of really great things that happened. And we got to the end of the year and it was almost like, wow, we have just got so much going on. And at the time I had four GAs that were all graduating and all of them went on to other colleges and, and got employed elsewhere. And there was a period of time in the summer where it was literally just me and Anthony Zona and Trevor Bierman, who was our recruiting coordinator at the time. And we're just like, okay, we just got to simplify, like, how do we make this thing run more efficiently? And so, you know, I guess my, my message for the, the coach that's maybe trying to do this thing by himself or only has one assistant and it's two man tackling 40 guys or whatever the case might be, it's, you know, I don't think that you have to add new technology. Of course, we're always doing that. You know, we've got Rapsodo, we still use Blast, we, but we've also tried to simplify that. Like, what are we going to use it for? If we don't need it, if there's no value to it from our eyes, then put it in a place where the players can access it and give them that opportunity. But at the same time, like we don't need to just put it out there to put it out there. So, you know, the simplification process or project for us this past year, I think made us more efficient and it helped us evolve. I'm not going to say in a better way, but definitely in a different way um, that I think definitely gave us a little bit of that clarity. Uh, moving into the 22 season that we just had. Mm. It's amazing. Just to, like you said, and you had a, 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 you're the oldest staff member at 29. It's pretty wild. And you, you said, you spoke about, um, so are you and Adam Posey pretty close? Did you talk to Adam? Yeah, I really like Adam a lot. I think he does a fantastic job at EMU. And yeah. He's another example of somebody that like uses his resources so uh, wisely. Oh, yeah. Somebody that, frankly, I've learned from just in our conversations or, you know, being able to watch his program from afar. Like, I think he's a guy that I've learned from um, because of that. He's, he's very – I would say he's a great steward of his resources and, uh, you know, definitely maximizes his, his program's ability, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had, we had a great conversation too, man. Just I learned a lot from him as well. And um, – this programming stuff, you know, like your guys are pretty a good bit about. Um, yeah, sharp guy, sharp guy. I know Jimmy Jackson speaks highly of him as well. Um, that's where I got. That's why. That's how I got to know him, Adam, through Jimmy. And um, but yeah, we had a great conversation. And uh, but I know you were saying um, you had a uh, a personal staff, right, from EMU. Yeah, Bree. Yeah, a creative content person. And, right. Um, yeah, so I think she was a graduate. Played, played field hockey there, graduated from EMU, was helping baseball, and we recruited her as well to come do her GA work at, at Charleston. Yeah. I think just think I think thinking even that, even that for the people who are listening, just thinking about what that could do, you know, in terms of not necessarily just recruiting your athletes, but recruiting your help, recruiting your staff, you know, and, and doing it in uh in very uh you know, unique manners. Um you know, from like, you know, you could have a magnet school, like you said, you could be a school within that has the art program, you know, you could have a, um, you know, what a thing to bring to your, your principals too, you know, saying here, I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to involve these other clues. You talk about exclusive, you know, right? Like what a, what a great word, right? Inclusion right now. And, and what that looks like. And that's what principals and, you know, that's really what our schools need, you know, and, and, um, and what a great way to do that. I think those are great avenues. Um, Cause like you said, no one's reading the the introduction on the website. And I think you hit that on the head. No one's reading that on the website. It's a matter of here's the video, here's the clips, here's 
um, bring it up to what it looks like nowadays. Yeah, no doubt. And I think I, I would just expand on that with this. Like, I know diversity, equity, and, and inclusion is a huge piece of you know college athletics right now. And you know, so I think to start with that piece, like, I believe that if we wanted to solve a lot of issues in college athletics as well as in the world, um, we got to start with empathy. And if you know of a way to develop empathy, then I would love to hear it because I think that is still a search that, that we are working on um, a lot at Charleston as far as with our student athletes, like how do we develop it? How do you practice it? Those are things that we really wrestle with all the time. But like that's the the, the value in – being committed to having a diverse staff, having a diverse program is because it goes back to the depth of the vision. Like I want our players to collaborate with people from whether it's color, uh, race, sexuality, um, socioeconomic status, like location of the country. We had guys from California, Washington State, Texas, Florida, New York, as well as Charleston, West Virginia on the team this year. Wow. Talk about the, 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 the way we want the world to look and collaborating with other different types of people in order to achieve greatness, which I think, you, you know, we, we won 40 games this year, you know, conference championship, regional appearance, like all of those things. I think that that's, that's why diversity is important. It's, it's the understanding and creating empathy because that's the type of program that you want. So, you know, in terms of how that goes back to your staff, like, I don't understand why women can't work in baseball, right? Like, I think that's a, listen, between my wife and my mother and, and now my daughter who's three, like, they're the ones running the house anyway. <laughs> like, when you talk about being organized, when you talk about getting stuff done, when you talk about being growth-minded and not necessarily stuck in your ways, like, I think there's a lot of women that probably have advantages uh, over in terms of their skill set over us men. So, you know, again, it's, it's all about for us creating the front door opportunity, welcoming those people into our walls and holding them into a high standard, but at the same time, empowering them to be the best version of themselves. And, uh, you know, I think that that's a huge component of our program. Coach Robbie Britt from the University of Charleston, just uh, another great conversation. Just really fortunate to have. Really appreciate Coach Britt taking some time, talk to us, help us get better, give a little taste in his program and how his program is. Um, if you're not following him, I would highly suggest following Coach Britt. Uh, anytime he's speaking, check it out. Look back at the old ABCA videos um, as he was a barnstormer a clinician. Um, email Robert Britt at ucwv.edu. Uh, great follow at Coach RB6. You can follow University of Charleston Baseball as well at ucwv underscore baseball. Just loved a lot of the, like the vocabulary in him, um, the, the clarifying principles. It gets into a little bit of um, how if you're – just using uh, uh, like our game as a platform, life skills and platform you're teaching through the content. If you're teaching so you can coach, you're all out of whack. Um, and just just how it's it's much more it's much more than that. Um, that is the game. So just wanted to um, again thank Coach Britt for the time. Thank him for all he did for us here today. And again, thank you guys. I'm glad for your feedback. I'm glad to, just shows that there is value. Shows that you appreciate it. Shows that um, what what we're doing here is helping, and that's what it's all about. Just help grow in the game. Let's continue to help grow the game and show how we are not only making better men but better ball players. We're working it, using the game as our platform of on and off the field to help the next generation. So, again, thanks so much to our sponsors at Netting Pros, and thank you guys for listening. Until next time, keep getting better.